How you doing? I'm Mike Gaddy and welcome to the 743 Patterson Park Podcast. This week I got to sit down with Anthony. You know him as Mr. Nice Guy Cocktails. The reason I wanted to talk to Anthony is because he started his business right when the pandemic hit. In fact, he had plans for a slightly different business and when the pandemic hit, he realized he had to change. Within just a few days, he completely revamped what he was planning to do to reflect the new reality. He opened Mr. Nice Guy Cocktails at the end of March. I am fascinated by this because as I said to Anthony during our interview, when the pandemic hit, a lot of people wanted to stick their head in the sand and they froze in place. I know because I was one of them. For a couple months, I had no idea what to do, how to adapt to the new reality of being stuck in our house. So please join me as we talk pandemic and opening a new business, flexing and changing with the needs of new regulations, how the restaurant industry may take this opportunity to adapt to a better path moving forward. Take a listen. Started Mr. Nice Guy Cocktails when the pandemic began, which I'm totally fascinated by because, you know, a lot of people dug a hole and stuck their head in it when the pandemic started and, you know, um, are still in that hole right now. And a lot of businesses had problems, including my own day job. You know, I'm an event photographer. So right now there's just not a lot of events <clears throat> going on, rightly so. But you took another approach. As soon as you realized that the rules had changed about cocktails, you launched a business and lo and behold, it's very successful. Tell us about that. So it was, uh, at that time I had been, uh, I was, I, I left Wicked Sisters, which was my previous location. And then I was working with us, this guy, Sebastian up at La Beretta, um, great steakhouse in Upper Fells Point. But uh yeah, it was this kind of Biden time looking for spaces. Uh, COVID hit and kind of threw a major wrench into it. Um, at that time, I had been talking to Sean Stewart, who's per, uh, with us now. Um, he was moving back from Tennessee. This was right around the time we did Rise Up. Uh, about this time last year, it was the first week of March, we did Rise Up, which is uh, the, uh, our, our, our version of the United States Bartender Skill. We have an independent uh, chapter here. So we do a, our big charity event every year for, uh, to raise money for the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. Um, you know, we get together and we, we, it's usually a big gala for us. So, you know, there I was talking to a couple of people about what I had planned on doing and, you know, lo and behold, we didn't know that there was a pandemic outbreak happening at the time that we're having this event. So, so you I know, fast it, forward, that was no more than 11 days later, the governor <laughs> shuts down everything. Um, so then, you know, I was, I, I was sitting on my couch. So, you know, again, fast forward to the 23rd, um, because I had to go and look this up. So it was the 23rd I made the decision to, to do something. Um, so six days after the announcement, uh, on the 24th, uh, Amazon had dropped off most of my plastic. So the very next day. And by the 27th, we were fully operational, open with a full menu. We had started with 10 cocktails. Um, we sold a fair amount of cocktails that weekend. And the, the menu actually grew to 20 cocktails in the second week. Um, 35 cocktails in the second month, and now we maintain a cocktail program of over 45 cocktails. It's the governor and, and the Baltimore City, and I don't know the rules, but th since they relax the liquor rules, you can do home delivery cocktails now, uh, or people pick them up, et cetera, so, so, which wasn't possible before. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, do I got that right? Yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's laws written right now so that you can repackage wine, you can repackage beer, but there was always this thing about repackaging liquor. And a lot of it's just control from the, the comptroller and stuff like that. And um, I think what happened was, was more so, I guess, good business practices. They, they really, I think that's what always kind of worried them in the, the past about this is having liquor very accessible to a guest, but they already had these kind of standards set for wine and beer where, you know, it had to be in a sealed container. It, it, it couldn't be like, it was supposed to be not readily servable out of the vessel that you gave it to. So that's why when you get a growler or something like that, they usually tape the top of it or with the swing tops, they usually kind of secure the same thing. Um, so that's why we went the route with like the, the juice containers. I kind of thought back to when I was a kid, 
Um, you know, you got those grenades, the juice grenades. So we started with those um, at first, found out that there was a reason why the ghost companies were using that, uh, those plastic, they just, they, they melt so easily. Um, so we had to upgrade to a little bit better packaging, which is what you see in most uh, juice bars now is, is the same packages and packaging we're using. Um, but yeah, kind of just, kind of just floated to that. It was um, like you said, the governor had loosened up the laws. Um, really, it was just to give businesses that didn't already have carry out the option for carry out. What we did was kind of do what a lot of uh, cocktail bars had done in other cities was interpret that rule in a completely different way, which was, wow, I can finally give you a cocktail to go. Um, you know, so you know, where we're at right now is there, there is a bill in the House Assembly, hopefully this passes, um, which would allow us to make this permanent. Um, I know they're talking about tacking it with a food option. I really hope they don't. It would definitely, it would, it would hinder what it was, it's supposed to be. But again, I think it's just to kind of curtail, you know, people drinking and driving. Um, uh, and, you know, so every day, that it's not pouring down rain or that the trash isn't frozen to the street, I go out and pick up litter around the neighborhood because you know they're not doing street cleaning right now, at least here. And I, you know, the majority of the litter is liquor bottles. So the idea that people aren't drinking outside of a you know bar is ludicrous because I I I mean there's every type of liquor bottle under the sun that I mean and wine and beer and coke and Pepsi and water don't just you know limit it to liquor and, and I'm just so I'm just surprised that these sort of prohibition era laws have even hung on as long as they have yeah and I mean being an 80s baby myself we all had the uncle or the aunt with the uh the the coffee mug we all knew it was in the coffee <laughs> mug you know, uh, I, I, you know, even growing up, you jokingly, we used to, I was mentioning this to someone the other day. It's like, how many, how many people go into the shore, grab a Gatorade and put some vodka in it? You know, like right. it's, it's, it, it's always been a thing. I think, it, I think it's just more so social acceptance. Uh, it's society just holding each other accountable. You know, it's, 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 it's things that we never really needed the government to tell us not to do or not to do. Who's Things our, our parents dealt with. And then I think, you know, those those blue laws, as they say, just never, never got rewritten. There's a ton of laws and tons of states that for whatever reason are just we're just stuck in time. And, uh, you know, I know a lot of people aren't happy with our mayor right now, but I, I mean, I'm going to be on the opposite side here. I can't I can't uh, I, I appreciate everything he's done since he's gotten office, not because I think it benefits my business, because I think he's putting the welfare of his his community before profit. As much as a lot of people don't think he is, I, I, I disagree there. Well, I actually, that's a question I often ask. I asked Andrew and I asked uh, Andrew Weiser now, who's opening the uh, restaurant up in Patterson Park, uh, Revisions Books and Bar, uh, and a couple of others. How has the city been in supporting small business during COVID? And, and everyone I've talked to have said that they've been actually pretty good in terms of adapting and changing. So you would agree with that? Yeah, um, in terms of the city being adaptable to people who wanna pivot, yeah, they've been great to us. Um, there's been no red tape in, in wanting to do things. Uh, really the only thing I see is just, and, and, and again, if I've had a business the same way for 15 years, I would be uncomfortable changing any direction you know, in a nine month, 12 month clip. There's, I, again, I, I'm not here trying to tell anyone how to run their business. Uh, I, I can only imagine how difficult it would be if I had opened before COVID and I was stuck in the same, you know, you know, residual payments month over month, just, just, you know, you can't really just hit that stop button. And I, and I understood where a lot of these businesses were coming from with a lot of their complaints, but I think to kind of expect things to go back to the way they were. You've had a year now to kind of figure that out and sitting on a, a, a stand on a soapbox yelling about, you know, this is still happening. Yeah, it's still happening. And you knew it was going to still happen. I mean, any, every pandemic we've had, you know, there's, there's, there's social history to this. It's been 18 to 24 months before a pandemic is usually over. What has surprised me is a lot of artists in particular that I've talked to have viewed the pandemic as being an excuse or not an excuse, but a stimulus to rethink how they do business. And that's what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, everyone, I, I'd say 
if you're not looking at this time to change what has been broken in this industry, then you're in this industry for the wrong reasons. I, I, you know, we've, and I went to school for music, so I can even speak to being on that creative side as just a musician as well. That system was broken. You had, you had, you had entities were making the money, not the creatives, you know, and then you look at labor laws and just things that were going on in our industry prior to this. You know, now with these skeleton crews, you have an opportunity to rebuild a staff with the right foundation. You know, again, it's been a year where we could have been fixing these things, things that we knew needed to be worked on. And now all we're worried about is reopening, but we're not worried about reopening safely or with the right standards or changing standards that were broken. We're just worried about opening. And I, and I, and I get that, but I think that's are you getting at, and I only ask this because Chef Andrew said something similar and he was getting at, he thought that the restaurant industry should take this opportunity, restaurant industry in particular, should take this opportunity to reconstruct from the ground up the business model of the restaurant industry. That what, what the tip model in particular for paying wages was broken, unfair, and unredeemable and should be abandoned now that we can with COVID and reinvent that. It, am I on the right path there? You are. I think, I think Andrew, Andrew makes valid points. I think the, the biggest thing though is we can't do it alone. It's, 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 you know, we've had restaurants try to do the tip, tip pools for the, for the kitchen, especially. I mean, I, it kills me that normal restaurants, you're usually 80, 20 to your mix, 80% food, 20% to the, the, the front of house in terms of liquor and wine and beer. But then you have a crazy disparity on salaries and, and, and the way that people make money. Now, yes, the, the front of house is a, a tipped employee at 363 an hour as opposed to the line cook who's making 18. So there is a guarantee there. But I can tell you right now that three that tipped employee is making well over $25 an hour. So I think it was one of those things that was a major disparity. But then there was also when you tried to eliminate that tip and then you tried to put it into the food items. So then paying a bartender $15 an hour and paying your, your line cook $22 an hour, but making it so that your food items are 20% more, guess we're like, no, I already feel like I'm paying way too much for this. And I think it was more, it's perceived value. It's, it's, it's almost like it's what really happened was in the nineties chain restaurants absolutely destroyed the American food industry. We were just starting to get people to believe in going to chef fronted restaurants. And this is what makes my job easier is when that happened, that's when people started to respect the bar programs more. So then what you saw was a correlation between bar teams and kitchen teams. And that's where we had this cocktail re re uh, renaissance. And that's when people started really caring about an old fashioned and, and Manhattans and all these pre-prohibition cocktails again. It was, you know, it's, it's twofold. You, you have the, the care in the kitchen and then it, it, it bleeds over into the bar program. You can't have one without the other. You can't have an elevated bar team with a kitchen that doesn't care. It, it, and, but that's, that's where I wish that, that we've been trying to bridge that gap for about 20 years now. Um, but I, like I said, I think it, speaking back to what you said about trying to make it where we change the industry, it's not just changing our industry from inside. It's changing the perception of the industry to the guest. They, they have to respect what is being done and the price point that they're paying for it at. And until that happens, I don't see the tip structure ever leaving. It seems to me that the foodie culture is helping to drive some of this change that you're talking about. Um, you know, um, and, and different uh, food influencers, you know, have a different take on it, but it does seem to me at the very least, you could make the argument that people really are going to a restaurant because of a chef or going to a bar because of a bartender. Okay, so you touched on uh, some, some different cocktails. You said pre-prohibition era cocktails or I guess right after. Uh, so what are some of the top selling co cocktails that you've been making and delivering and having for pickup? So um, right now we have our, our Allen wrenches on the menu. That's our uh, brown butter old fashioned uh, using Sagamore rye. Um, then building off of that portfolio, there's the nine pound hammer, which is our version of a Sazerac. And that also features 10th Ward out of Frederick's, uh, absinthe. Um, moving on from there, we have the pineapple express. Now you might also realize that these are all marijuana strains. When we first opened, 
Mr. Nice Guy is a kind of a rift off the half-baked with Dave Chappelle. Uh, so when we opened, we were a pop-up. The idea was to get a couple bartenders off their couch, you know, kind of deliver some drinks, kind of like their whole premise was to, you know, sell some marijuana to get their buddy out of jail. So when originally when we started, we were using all weed strains. We ripped through about 60 of them before we were like, all right, we got to tailor off a little bit. And then we, uh, we started a series. That was when Tiger King came out. So then we had uh, Tiger's Blood, Tiger's Milk, and Tiger's Tears. Uh, Tiger's Blood and Tiger's Tears are actually still our one of our up in those two best-selling cocktails um tiger tears is our uh as our watermelon aperol spritz um and then tiger's blood would be our version of a um a tequila mule so tequila gin uh, cassis i use a we use a french uh blackberry or blackcurrant cassis um and uh ginger beer uh so those those end up being on our that's on our specialties menu uh, those end up being classic cocktails that almost everyone can either circle back to some some something they've tried in the past. Um, there's about 15 to 18 of those right now. And then we have our experimentals menu. So for the last seven months, these guys have been, we've been basically experimenting. I mean, when you put four bartenders in a, in a workspace and we have some hours to work on some things, we're able to do what, you know, a lot of these culinary teams were able to do. So our experimentals menu are those oddballs, those ones where you're like, what is going on here? You know, like when you walk into, when you had your favorite bartender, you'd be like, Hey, I've been working on this for a couple of weeks now. Let me, let me, uh, let me try it out on you. So those, those rotate out, um, weekly. Um, some of them don't even last a week. Some of them will be on there for a couple months, but, um, that menu, that's probably our baby right now. That one's the, the specialty one that that'll never change. Those will always be the same, but the, the, um, the experimental ones are definitely the more fun ones. Okay, so you mentioned Sean. Who are some of the other bartenders that you've been working with on on this project? Gotcha. So we have uh, we have Sean Stewart. Uh, there's Greg Mergner. Um, there's Heath Gornflow, and then R.J. Schuler would round out my team right now. And in addition to Mr. Nice Guy's cocktails, which you said started up as a pop up, now has become more permanent. But you have partnered or launched. I'm a little unclear on some food, um, I'm thinking of the steaks out front and and sort of these pop-up menus. So just talk a little bit about that going on because I think that's really cool. Gotcha, so yeah, we I jokingly, um, in-house when you pull up on our POS system, uh, it says at the top that the menu is called I Make Drinks. And I usually use this as my premise. When someone's talking to me about something else, it's not that I, I, I can appreciate it, I love it, but I make drinks. I don't make food. I've worked for really, really good food people. I've worked for a lot of James Beard semifinalists, finalists. Unfortunately, I've never worked for someone who's won, but uh, I, I, always the bridesmaid, right? Um, but we, uh, in the beginning, we were fortunate. Um, Jesse Sandlin was opening up her spot in Highland Town, uh, super, you know, Baltimore celebrity chef. Uh, so we were lucky. She got hit with some red tape from the city. So we popped up with her for a month. Um, we were fortunate to grab a chef over the summer uh, from the, uh, the Pendry. He was awesome. He was, a, he was making fresh bread. Um, and then we kind of went into this like uh, rotating kitchen scene. So we started looking for some, uh, some food trucks, some like-minded people who wanted to come in and just make some food. Like, like I said, we make drinks. So we're giving you everything a chef would ever want, a full front of house team. And all you have to do is come in and cook and create. Um, so we recently teamed up with, uh, the Vec Veciola brothers. I should have asked them the pronunciation of that, but, uh, I'm going to Veciola, I'm going to, I'm going to butcher it. But anyway, uh, it was, uh, Josh used to work over at, uh, parts and labor and then another place out in the County. And then his brother was, uh, running, uh, was, a uh, a front of house guy for uh, a restaurant group down in New Orleans. So when they got, uh, Nick's down there, they decided to start this fuzzy's food truck, uh, concept. Um, they were with us for about five weeks um, this past week. And then this week we're doing an in-house pop-up called Grizzly Steaks or Gritty Steaks, my fault. Um, uh, the uh, Greg and uh, Sean and myself either lived in Philly or lived out in the suburbs of Philly for most of our uh, pre-adolescent lives. Uh, so we have a very strong uh, feeling towards Philly. So when we were looking at doing something, I was like, I just want a Philly cheesesteak. Uh, and apparently a lot of other people did too, because we oh, saw it goes with the pot. 
we sold an abs we sold an insane amount of cheese sticks i i was like i know other places around us are selling cheese sticks so but uh you know we we did it the right way we i got i literally am getting the meat from philly uh i'm making the cheese in house we're getting the bread from philly so we're not we're not skimping in any any i just didn't get the onions from philly because you know philly onions uh <laughs> But yeah, that's kind of where we're at with uh, the food program. We just want to, um, I actually have a whole pipeline of food trucks coming into Nice Guy uh, over the next uh, month and a half. Um, just kind of trying to support other local businesses. We've, uh, we've teamed up with Full Circle Donuts up in Hamden uh, to do some brunch pop-ups. Um, we're teaming up with uh, uh, this uh, charcuterie in a box is the name of the, uh, this other company. That's a local woman who's doing been doing charcuterie boards on the side. So we're gonna start carrying her charcuterie boards and doing pre-sales of those. Um, I know I'm missing someone. We've, we, we, we really just like working with as many small businesses as we can. Um, oh, uh, 1810 on the square, uh, best day ever. Um, just, you know, anyone that reaches out, we have we, uh, we've worked with uh, a couple, we've worked with some schools to do some fundraisers, um, you know, really anything. Uh, you know, we're down. 11 days. 11 days is the amount of time between Anthony's last event and the governor shutting the restaurant industry completely down in Baltimore and in Maryland. He had just a few days after that to consider and to revamp how he was going to move his business forward given the new regulations and the new reality. What he created, and I cut out part of the, of the interview because this was before we were, he was ready, he was still setting everything up, but he said something that, that to me just rang a bell as loud as a foghorn, which is he creates because he likes to create. He creates for the sake of creating. In those few days, he created something new. He created a new business that didn't exist in Baltimore before and hopefully will continue to thrive after the pandemic ends. It's people like Anthony, those voices who create for the sake of creating that have kept me sane during the pandemic, how they have dealt with and not only adapted to, but changed and morphed to thrive in an environment when other people are treading water. Next week, we're gonna to talk to another social media influencer, but this one, this one Chef Weiserl held up as being one of the reasons why Baltimore is such an up and coming food city. We're gonna to talk to the food nomad, and he's an Asian American, so his unique perspectives on how Asian Americans are being blamed by the COVID for the COVID-19 pandemic is a voice that I'm anxious to have on this podcast. So please join me. Meanwhile, have a great week, and we'll see you soon.